is that a tree? Well, most people would say yes. I'd say, well, you've got about half of the story there, or maybe not quite half of the story. People often forget about tree roots and all the interesting things that are going on in the soil. But of course, uh, most of our trees, it's not just about what's above ground. It's not just about the roots that are below ground. They're involved in lots of interactions with lots of fungi and bacteria and other soil organisms. So is that a tree? Well, it's only part of the story. And what we're really interested in, uh, in the field of mycorrhizal research, uh, is these uh, fungal species that form symbiotic associations uh, with the roots of plants. So mycorrhiza, if you didn't know the term before, it literally means fungus root. And a mycorrhiza is an organ that is formed jointly by a plant and a fungus. And on the left there, we have some photos of ectomycorrhizas. Ectomycorrhizas uh, form a sheath around the outside of a plant root. You can see them with a the naked eye. If you go around and uh, dig around in the soil underneath some trees, uh, if you go and dig up around some pines, you'll probably find lots of very, very uh, visible uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And then there are also our buscular mycorrhizas, uh, which you can't see with the naked eye, but um, if you get a high power microscope and you look at the cells and plant roots, then you might see some of these little uh, arbuscules, uh, structures inside individual plant cells. So mycorrhizal fungi, uh, they associate with about 93% of angiosperms, 82% of vascular plants. We now know that there are types of mycorrhizas that associate with non-vascular plants as well. We've got our buscular mycorrhizas that associate with uh, a much higher diversity of species, ectomycorrhizas that associate uh, with fewer species, but the species that they tend to associate with uh, often have very large distributions. And there are lots of other types of mycorrhizas as well, uh, ericoid mycorrhizas, orchid mycorrhizas, and so on. These are engaged in nutrient cycling, uh, water uptake, protection from pathogens, uh, and signal transfer. So the fungi are uh, infiltrating the soil. Here's that a classic photo uh, by, from uh, the cover of Smith and Reed from Mycorrhizal Symbiosis, where you can see a pine seedling and you can see uh, swillus uh, mycorrhizal fungi on the root. So you can see all of the hyphae infiltrating out into the soil there. Uh, and they are collecting nutrients from the soil. In exchange, they're getting uh, carbon, uh, usually in the form of uh, different sugars from the plant host that have been recently photosynthesized. And then in the middle here at the bottom, we've got some arbuscular mycorrhizas that are uh, infiltrating uh, plant roots and forming structures inside uh, intracellularly. And you're probably all aware, uh, even if you weren't all that familiar with mycorrhizas uh, before. Uh, you've probably heard of the wood wide web, uh, which is an idea that was popularized thanks to some research that uh, Suzanne Samor did. Uh, and of course, the idea of the wood wide web is about all of these uh, connections between uh, plants that are formed by fungi and their hyphae. I thought it would be useful to go back in time a little. Uh, I, I really think that uh, getting a little bit of evolutionary perspective on uh, what we're studying is really useful. So uh, just a quick jaunt through the last 1.5 billion years here. Uh, there's this fantastic paper by uh, Lutzoni et al uh, from 2018, where they look at uh, the radiations of fungi and plants um, over deep time. Uh, it's in Nature Communications. Uh, some really great research here. Basically, on the left of the screen, we've got our single cell fungi appearing about 1.5 billion years ago. You can just about see where humans appear on the uh, right hand side of the screen there. Um, I'm just going to walk you through a few key moments in the evolution of uh, fungi. Here we've got the oldest terrestrial fungi appearing somewhere between uh, 800 and 700 million years ago. Oh, hold on a sec. Uh, 
technical difficulties. Okay. Working again, hopefully. <laughs> that is always looks, good. looks great. Okay. Okay. All this terrestrial fungi about 700 to 800 million years ago. Here's the Cam Cambrian explosion at the end of the Ediacaran. And we have terrestrial embryophytes and AM fungi appearing somewhat simultaneously somewhere around uh, between about uh, 500 million years ago and 440 million years ago. Um, and we have the appearance of lichens. And we've got wood and roots appearing. So plants starting to form uh, woody structures, uh, roots infiltrating the soil. We start to get coal accumulating. Our ECM fungi appear somewhere in here, so after the development of uh, roots and the accumulation of coal, and uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi appear to have evolved from uh, white rot and brown rot fungi. Uh, so we have these lignin degrading peroxidases that appear, um, and then of course the coal accumulation tails off as fungi are able to start breaking down uh, lignin. And I've also thrown in uh, the Panaceae here, so ectomycorrhizal fungi, which is the group that I mainly work on, um, and the pines, or the, the Panaceae, um, are tightly linked, and um, the spread of the pines and the success of the pines has often been um, considered to be at least in part due to their association with ectomycorrhizal fungi. So just to give you some of the the deep time history there of, uh, of fungi and plants and mycorrhizas. So we're talking about processes um, that have been going on for a long time. So mycorrhizal symbiosis has ancient origins, and this means that it's endured many cycles of global change, including mass extinctions. Uh, these um, associations form a link between above ground and below ground processes, and potentially uh, the fungi are more are able to respond more rapidly to changes than their hosts. And I'll just put down uh, a few figures here to show you some of these um, ancient fossils of mycorrhizal structures, which are always really impressive. There's some 52 million year old uh, fossil ectomycorrhizae in amber there, uh, and uh, one of my personal favorites because it's from the Rhiney Church, which is not far from where I grew up in Aberdeenshire. Uh, at the bottom right there, there's a 400 million year old um, fossil uh, orbuscular mycorrhiza from the early Devonian. Um, so well preserved that you can see it in, uh, in these fossils. So they've been around for a long time. Now, when I started uh, working on mycorrhizas, it was during my PhD, and what I was really interested in was uh, spatial patterns of organisms. So how do things change uh, in space? How do they change over time? How are they distributed? And my PhD work uh, was looking at uh, spatial processes in um, ectomycorrhizas. So what you can see here is on the left-hand side of the screen, you've got the distribution of all fine roots within a 20 meter by 20 meter a plot of a Scots pine forest. And then on the right hand side of the screen, you can see where uh, the ectomycorrhizal fungi of different species uh, are distributed within that root system. And uh, what I found was that there were patchy distributions of different species um, that were distributed at different scales. Some species uh, appear to be competing with each other, so competitive interactions and exclusion. Other species seem to be facilitating each other. So I think it's always important to remember when we're thinking about these systems that you have lots and lots of different processes that are going on between all the different players. So uh, different species of mycorrhizal fungi uh, may be helping to uh, provide uh, 
benefits to their hosts, um, but they're also likely to be competing with other fungi um, in in various different ways. And this has consequences for um, where we find them and how they are uh, distributed. I've also been really interested in the vertical distribution of mycorrhizas uh, through the soil. Uh, Jane and I were just talking about scratching the surface earlier before you all joined. Um, I published a paper with uh, my colleague Jason Pether called Still Scratching the Surface, um, How Much of the Black Box of Soil Ectomycorrhizal Communities Remains in the Dark. And what we were getting at with this was when you look at uh, the amount of rooting depth that studies uh, generally consider, it's usually a very small amount of um, the rooting profile uh, and different ecosystems. Plants uh, have different rooting depths on average. So uh, if you dig down 50 centimeters uh, in a tundra environment, you're more likely to capture a large amount of the root profile than if you were to dig 50 centimeters down in the Mediterranean environment, for example. Um, I think it's still fair to say that uh, mycorrhizas uh, and roots in general are chronically undersampled. Um, it's difficult. It's technically challenging to look at the roots of different uh, plants because you have to dig them up. Um, and I think it's probably also fair to say that some of the assumptions that are made about the importance of looking for things at depth uh, become somewhat circular when you have people arguing about how um, mycorrhizas are mostly distributed in the upper soil layers, but most of the studies really only focus on the upper soil layers. So a few uh, interesting things to think about there. So spatial vertical distributions, mycorrhizas are distributed in the soil on different scales, uh, doing lots of different things. Um, you're probably all interested in mycorrhizal networks. Uh, this is one of the exciting uh, things that um, Suzanne Samard has really uh, captured the public's attention with lately. You might also hear them refer to as common mycorrhizal networks, CMNs. And so we've got our tree over here uh, with all its fungi, of course. Here's another tree. Well. Of fungi, if you have the same fungus that links up multiple trees, uh, then you've got your mycorrhizal network. And of course, you've got multiple fungal species. Uh, some of them are going to be associating with uh, one tree. Some of them are, might be associating with multiple trees, uh, trees of different species. You can see how it starts to get quite uh, complicated. And Suzanne was able to show uh, carbon transfer through fungal mycelium in forests, so from one tree to another through its mycorrhizas. And this has been popularized as the idea of the wood wide web. And as I said, of course, it gets increasingly complex when you start to add in multiple species, because then you have uh, some fungi that will associate with multiple hosts, some fungi that associate with single hosts. Then we have uh, fungi that are present on some seedlings uh, and herbaceous plants and so on and so on and so on. So we get multiple plant species connected by fungi, but we can also have multiple types of fungal network in the soil. So you might have ectomycorrhizal networks and arbuscular mycorrhizal networks and ericoid mycorrhizal networks and orchid mycorrhizal networks. And some of those orchid mycorrhizas form ectomycorrhizas and ectomycorrhizal hosts, and some of the ericoid mycorrhizas form ectomycorrhizas and ectomycorrhizal hosts. And so there's lots of different layers of complexity in these networks. So we have the potential for, in some cases, there to be links between trees and shrubs and herbs and grasses and orchids. So our plant communities um, are often engaged in all of these um, really uh, broad or complicated networks below ground. Which brings us to uh, how do we how do we know that there's uh, that things are being transferred around through mycorrhizas? Well, there's been some great research on that. I'm just going to use an example of one of the experiments that I've been involved in uh, in this experiment. And a lot of this work is actually done on seedlings because it's much easier to uh, to deal with seedlings, as I'm sure you can imagine. 
working with seedlings in controlled conditions in greenhouses is a lot easier than working with mature trees and seedlings in the field. So this is an example of a study that I did uh, where we have uh, two seedlings in the same pot, and there's a bag here separating them, and the bag either allows or blocks uh, fungal hygiene from passing through. We've got a bigger owner seedling and a smaller receiver seedling, and here you can see different colors um, for different subsections that have been harvested. We can look at uh, what's happening in the shoots, what's happening in the roots, what's happening with the ectomycorrhizal fungi, what's happening uh, in the rhizosphere, what's happening in different soil fractions. Um, and essentially what we do here is label one of these seedlings. One of the seedlings is inner seedling, uh, and we give it 13, uh, 13 C labeled CO2. It photosynthesizes that, and then we trace where the 13 C goes through the uh, system. Um, here's a figure from one of my papers where we're showing the direction of 13C transfer. So what you have here is our plant or donor plant root on the left. And then we've got the donor plant ectomycorrhizas. That's the plant fungal um, uh, joint organ. Then we've got the rhizoplane, so the interface between uh, the mycorrhiza and the soil. We've got different soil fractions, we've got our mesh, uh, and then we've got our receiver ectomycorrhizas and our receiver uh, plant roots. And what we can see here is that uh, we're finding elevated uh, 13C, which has been photosynthesized by the donor uh, in these different uh, types of tissue that include plant tissue, fungal tissue, um, higher eukaryotes in general, and then we've got gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And hopefully what you can see here is that uh, we can see that most of the uh, 13C, so that transferred carbon um, is passing through fungal uh, biomass in these different uh, components of the system, all the way through into the plant again, into our receiver plant on the right-hand side there. Um, so, in the course of this work, we found that uh, there's some evidence of um, uh, kin-selected transfer. So plants that are more closely related to each other seem to be transferring more carbon in some cases. Uh, we're seeing transfer of carbon regardless of stress that's introduced. Um, and we've been working on this in both lab and field experiments. As I said, it's a lot harder in the field, especially when you're being eaten alive by mosquitoes or black flies in um, central BC, uh, which is where we did quite a few of these experiments. And we think that um, a lot of the time what we're seeing is uh, when we see the transfer of carbon moving from one plant to another, we think it's probably actually signaling molecules that include carbon. Um, they're small quantities, but, uh, but we see significant differences. So those are the sorts of experiments that, that we've been doing to look at uh, how things move around in mycorrhizal networks. I also mentioned uh, that mycorrhizas can be involved in water uptake. There's been some really great work on that by other researchers. I just wrote a, a book chapter about um, the implications of uh, water uptake by uh, mycorrhizas for forest resilience. Um, and uh, used some evidence from uh, other researchers. And essentially, in some systems, particularly Mediterranean forest systems where uh, there are uh, strong seasonal droughts, um, we get uh, mycorrhizal fungi interacting with the bedrock, helping to break down the bedrock, um, roots and mycorrhizal fungi interfacing with bedrock transferring water into the taproots of the trees, it then gets transferred up and across into the fine roots closer to the surface. Uh, thanks to leaky hyphae, uh, water in the hyphae um, can get transferred into uh, other nearby plants. So the act of these big trees um, pulling water up through their roots and redistributing it at the surface um, and binding it 
its way into fungal hyphae uh, means that some of that water then escapes and uh, ends up in nearby plants. That's that's what seems to be occurring. Okay, so those are some of the processes that mycorrhizas are involved in. Uh, I thought I would um, talk about a little bit more about some of the research I've been doing. Um, I've often been thinking about these various different processes uh, in the research that I've been involved in. So how does climate change uh, interact with um, and generate plant responses? How does that interact with symbioses? What does it mean for our future forests? And a lot of the, uh, the work that I've done in British Columbia in particular has been on um, assisted range expansion and thinking about future forests. Of course, our future forests are going to be shaped by climate change. Um, it's predicted and we already know that things are getting warmer and drier. So we're seeing increased aridity and forest fires. But we also see uh, that it gets warmer and wetter in some places. And so in addition, sometimes to the aridity and the forest fires, we get increased humidity and flooding. Um, and of course, we're also uh, seeing less ice, albedo increases, we get more warming, we get permafrost melting, tree line expansion, um, and lots of these processes, of course, have consequences for our trees uh, and also mycorrhizal fungi. So I was thinking about ectomycorrhizas and climate change when I was a postdoc with Keith Egger and Ugh Mascot and Scott Green up in Prince George at UNBC. And we were thinking about all of these uh, issues uh, of um, if we know what our current distributions of trees are uh, and we know what the predictions suggest that future distributions are going to be of the trees, what does that mean for the fungi? Because climate change may affect different partners in this symbiosis differently. Our hosts are going to respond to uh, pathogens to change the temperature and moisture, carbon dioxide, land use change. The fungi may respond to uh, changes in host distributions, uh, changes in disturbance regimes, changes in nutrient deposition. And of course, classic example in British Columbia, uh, we've got the 18.1 uh, million hectares, probably more now, that were affected by uh, pine beetle. Uh, leading to a mass death of um, pines on the landscape. And there was a lot of thought uh, and discussion at the time of well, what's, what's going to replace pine. What we were really interested in was um, how do these changes in host distributions interact with uh, changes in symbiont distributions? And we predicted that um, obviously it were obvious to us that it was going to be um, uh, more important for uh, seeds and seedlings than for uh, mature trees. So very quickly, the concept of assisted migration, uh, there's a few different um, versions of it that you'll commonly see. Assisted population migration, uh, that's where you transfer seed from uh, different individual populations of the same species within the overall distribution of that species. Then you've got assisted range expansion, which is where you take seed from a species and move it out of its current range, usually into areas where you think it's going to do well. And then there's also the concept of assisted species migration, which is where you move uh, seeds from a species where it's doing really poorly in the hope that it's going to do well uh, elsewhere. And so we got involved in this great big experiment in uh, British Columbia that was set up by Greg O'Neill using 48 test sites across 22 degrees of latitude and longitude, uh, 50 seed sources. Um, here you can see the red circles are places where we did additional uh, tree planting at these different sites uh, in different climatic zones. And the little purple dashed area there uh, was the edge of the distribution of Western larch, which is one of the species that we use. And then the light blue uh, was the distribution range of uh, spear dogs fur, which was one of the other species that we used. So we're planting these out in these different environments and interested in uh, how are the different seedlings going to respond both to uh, changes in climate and soils and mycorrhizas. Uh, and I'm going to focus here on uh, the survival rates. Uh, so 
within uh, the current distribution of interior Douglas fir, uh, the survival rates were generally pretty good. But as you uh, as you can see, in some cases we had no survival uh, within the natural range, often connected to extreme drought, um, low survival on the edge of the range, and then surprisingly we found. Um, seedlings of these species doing pretty well, uh, well outside of their range. This is uh, Fort St. John, FO, and Whitehorse uh, up in Yukon Territory. What we found was that uh, the seedlings that, that grew really slowly and that didn't grow very much at all, which the foresters didn't particularly uh, like because they grew so slowly, um, were the ones that usually managed to survive in these uh, more extreme conditions. And we'd often find uh, that they were uh, covered in mycorrhizas. Um, so you get good survival in these extreme conditions, probably because uh, they were sitting in amongst uh, the rest of the ground vegetation uh, getting a bunch of uh, shelter uh, from conditions, allowing them to um, survive longer than they might have otherwise. And then the seed lots that grew really quickly that uh, the foresters were very excited about uh, would die uh, almost immediately uh, in those uh, extreme conditions. So we saw some interesting interactions there between um, even within these improved seed lots uh, in terms of what they could actually do, what conditions they could tolerate. Um, and so uh, we've been back to some of those sites to uh, to see what's going on, and um, it's. Interesting. Here you can see this is uh, me and Brendan Twig doing some field work on these sites. Uh, these are uh, six year old larch trees. Uh, Brendan's quite a tall guy. You can see how big these larch are. And inside the orange circle, there are some of them are already producing cones. Now, whether the, the seed in those cones is viable or not, I don't know. But you can see a range of uh, sizes of different trees uh, that were getting, um, growing and outside of their natural range. Uh, we're often finding uh, lots of mycorrhizal colonization on these uh, trees, but they're, you know, in some cases, they're even producing seed at six or seven years, which seems rather quick. Um, it got me thinking about, strangely, uh, it got me thinking about the past uh, and forests of the recent past. Um, and I started doing some uh, some work with uh, a couple of paleoecologists and a biogeographer uh, on uh, the movement of pines after the last glacial maximum. So here's the world 21,000 years ago. Uh, this is based on one of um, uh, paleo maps. You can see, of course, the big ice sheets over in North America here. So around about 16,000 years before present, we have this great big ice sheet and all these little squares uh, are um, filled with colors based on the uh, biome types. And this data was provided by Jack Williams, who's involved in the Neotoma pollen database. Uh, and these are our uh, best extrapolations of the different types of biomes that were present uh, in North America. 16,000 years ago, and I'll just move forward. Um, 14 years ago, we got the ice sheets retreating, and we can see the movement of these biomes quite dramatically in many cases. So, over time, we've got the retraction of the ice sheets, we've got uh, changes in the distribution of biomes, and of course, this is due to the movement of individual species and the distribution of plants and so on. And I think it's quite common for people to think about uh, the glacial North America as having you know, big expanses of tundra around the edges of the ice sheets and then forests much further back. But in fact, uh, it looks like there were forests right up against the edges of some of these massive ice sheets. And so what we see is over time, we've got uh, the distribution of biomes changing as uh, plants are moving around. What was what, what were the plants responding to and what were the factors involved in this? And people have been arguing about this for, for a long time. Um, often things like um, 
maturely species that have smaller seeds are going to be distributing uh, themselves more quickly. So they're going to be um, following the uh, the loss of the ice a lot more quickly than trees that produce big seeds and so on. But there weren't clear patterns like that when people actually started looking at the data. And arguments will go back and forth about what was happening here. What, what I was curious about was, well, what about fungi? How, how do the symbionts of the plants potentially um, influence the way that uh, they succeed when they disperse into new environments, which again was connected to those questions that uh, Keith Egger and I were thinking about during my So I started working with uh, Jason Pither at uh, UBCO uh, and then with um, uh, John Williams and Alejandro Ordonez on uh, factors influencing uh, the range dynamics of trees uh, after the last glaciation, but thinking about it from a symbiont point of view. And what we did was uh, to collect information, the best available information that we had on uh, the number of different uh, symbiotic fungal species that different hosts are known to associate with. And we combined that with lots of other data. Uh, and what we found was that the best explanation uh, or the, the best predictions of um, the recolonization uh, of the Northern Territory following uh, degradation was if a host associated with a higher diversity of fungi and had smaller seeds, then you got faster migration. So the idea here is that if you've got smaller seeds, then you're going to need uh, more nutrients more quickly than if you have larger seeds. If you are also able to associate with more beneficial fungi, then you're more likely to land in a patch of soil and be able to establish yourself and get nutrients. Uh, and so we were able to, uh, to model the northward migration of plants um, using uh, the diversity of fungi uh, and seed size. Uh, and interestingly, we found uh, that there was no effect of climate uh, on the northern um, expansion rate of um, uh, different trees in North America, uh, but very significant or significant climate impacts on the southern uh, distribution rates. So we think that's because uh, things start to die of drought stress in the south of their range, whereas in the north they're able to open up and move into new habitat. And that's also got me thinking about some of these um, concepts in deep time about how ectomycorrhizas uh, diversify, how the fungi diversify uh, and disperse, and how uh, different movements uh, of uh, hosts and fungi might occur and what that might lead to. So I've been working with a paleobotanist looking at a few key periods in uh, North American uh, ancient history. Uh, particularly looking at the early Eocene climatic optimum to try and get some data, uh, at least from the host side, for some of these questions. And I won't go into this in too much detail, but there's a few different concepts. Um, fungi might be able to switch hosts, um, fungi and plants might co disperse, uh, and fungi and hosts might uh, co diversify in situ. And this leads to all sorts of potential different scenarios for diversification and changes in uh, the way that uh, fungi and plants interact with each other. Okay, so I'm going to finish up with um, a few examples of some of the research that I've been uh, involved in uh, setting up and um, doing over the last few years. Here's Suzanne. Uh, this is the Mother Tree Project, which I wrote with Suzanne while I was a postdoc for her at UBC uh, and has been very successful. Um, we've looking at um, or the questions we were most interested in were given climate change, uh, given all of the impacts um, on the landscape uh, in British Columbia in this case, um, how do we do forestry more effectively in the future? Um, so we wanted to look at how uh, forest harvesting techniques uh, and different levels of tree retention uh, affect 
but things like carbon storage and biodiversity, how do they affect nutrient cycling, and how do they affect the resilience of resulting forests. And we're doing uh, things like looking at natural regeneration, we're looking at planted seedlings, we're looking at um, ectomycorrhizal uh, interactions. And uh, we initially planned to set up about uh, 25 plots, uh, and we've got about 125 so far that have been set up. Um, over 85,000 seedlings have been planted. There's three PhD students that have graduated and five MSc students graduated from this project. Uh, and Suzanne's been uh, very effective at getting additional funding. Um, now we've got this great uh, resource that's set up through British Columbia. So we've got uh, different sites planted um, in the areas around these different locations. Uh, we've also got, it's primarily focused on interior Douglas fir, but we do have our Malcolm Nat site for coastal Douglas fir, and we're hoping to set up uh, some co more coastal Douglas fir sites. But there's quite a wide range of uh, climates in here and soils as well. And what we see is that um, as we move into forests uh, of increasing aridity, we get less overall carbon storage. Uh, and so we're, we've been doing some work on uh, how uh, the different types of harvesting uh, impact the carbon that's actually in situ uh, in these different forests. So there's a couple of papers that we published recently on that. Uh, but some of the some of the really fun experiments that um, that I've done in this uh, that we're working on publishing at the moment um, was looking at um, mother tree transfer of carbon to seedlings. So as I mentioned, trying to do uh, studies where you trace uh, carbon moving from mature trees to seedlings is really difficult, especially if you think about, you can't very easily put a big gas labeling bag over a giant mature tree. So um, with Gabriel Orego here, he uh, graduated from his MSc uh, with me and Suzanne uh, two years ago now. Um, we worked on a technique for um, essentially what I like to think of as being an intravenous drip for a tree. So uh, using stem injection with 13C sugars, in this case, glucose. So we inject the glucose into the tree as the tree's drawing down um, uh, photosynthates. Uh, and then we're sampling soils, roots, and nearby seedlings. So the, uh, the alpha version, the alpha test version, that's Gabriel and I uh, messing around in the Douglas fir forest, trying to uh, come up with uh, different strategies for labeling. Uh, and the final strategy that he came up with was a lot more elegant than this, uh, but it is nice to show what sometimes what practical uh, field work looks like. Gabriel was able to successfully label, uh, I think it was eight, uh, mature, in this case, Western hemlock trees. Uh, and we were able to find uh, elevated 13C in nearby seedlings of the same species. Uh, the majority of the trees that he labeled uh, resulted in nearby labeled seedlings uh, with small but significant quantities of 13C. And interestingly, we could see, uh, so we had seedlings that were on uh, dead logs in these environments. And we found uh, links. Uh, so ectomycorrhizal hyphae were going into the dead logs and uh, associating with the seedlings on these logs. And we were finding transfer of 13C from the mature trees to those seedlings. So that was a fun experiment uh, and very, very difficult to do. Uh, then more recently, uh, I've been doing some work on nurse trees and ectomycorrhizas, uh, looking at oak regeneration in central Texas. Here's a photo from central Texas, not what I was expecting at all. Uh, you've got these really rich, diverse forests, uh, stunning waterways. Uh, and in this case, I was invited to, uh, to go out there to work with scientists from the city of Austin. Now, mostly they are interested in uh, rare birds, so preserving bird habitat. So we've got the golden-cheeked warbler and the black cat vireo here, and they uh, nest in association with uh, ash juniper and uh, shin oak. Here's Texas. Here is 
Austin and the Edwards Plateau, uh, where this work has been done. Uh, and it is home to uh, ash juniper, which is thoroughly hated by uh, most or many Texans. Certainly ranchers really hate ash juniper. There are all sorts of weird and wonderful stories uh, that they will come out with to explain to you why ash juniper is in fact an exotic invasive species, despite the fact that this is its natural distribution right here. If you're interested in those weird and wonderful stories, do ask later because some of them would blow your mind. Um, this is what juniper looks like on the landscape uh, after uh, all, everything's been ripped out uh, and it's been heavily grazed. Uh, ash juniper is often the only thing that can then recolonize uh, these, uh, what, what are now pasture lands. Uh, and so you often see them in these little clumps and you'll see lots of uh, related plant diversity around uh, underneath them in the shade. Over here on the right, we've got a nice mature ash juniper tree. Um, all, this, uh, all these strips of bark that peel off it um, are what the golden sheep warbler uses to make its nest, and it will only be able to get the materials for nest building from ash juniper that are uh, 50 years old or older. Um, so that's and that's part of its uh, life cycle. As they fly up from Mexico, they come to uh, this area, uh, the Edwards Plateau. They look for ash juniper and they use the ash juniper to make their nests. Um, it's also an area of extremely high oak diversity. Uh, there were four oak species in the study areas we were looking at. But if you go from uh, Texas through into Mexico, there's something like 180 uh, oak species. So these were the ones that we found in our plots, and we were particularly interested in this shin oak, which is used uh, for nesting by the black cat vireo. So here's a, a, a photo that I took. You can see uh, Austin in the background there. And in the foreground, you've got some juniper oak forest. That's what it probably should look like. Uh, and this is what it looks like after uh, the ranchers have gone in and ripped out the juniper um, to encourage oak to grow. Uh, usually what happens is all the oak dies, uh, everything else dies, and then the ash juniper slowly comes in and starts to recolonize it. The people I was working with uh, city of Austin were interested in how do we regenerate these areas uh, and um, they were very interested in the below ground perspective uh, and so we did some work together uh, planting lots of acorns uh, in different types of habitat so areas where trees were still alive and appeared to have uh, resisted the effects of uh, local droughts uh, and then in nearby areas where uh, every, all the trees had died due to drought, uh, and then areas where everything had been ripped out uh, and was now replaced by uh, invasive grassland. And what we did was four years after we planted the, the acorns, we went back and dug them up and really didn't know what we were getting ourselves in for because is showing our six different plots. The, this is the depth, the rooting depth of the seedlings. When we started digging, we'd find most of the mature tree fine roots and ectomycorrhizal fungi were in about seven to 10 centimeters of depth. And then we'd hit the first, line, first limestone layer at around 15 to 18 centimeters. And we would discover that our seedlings were all burrowing down uh, into the limestone sometimes through multiple layers of limestone. You can see uh, we've got seedlings that are uh, down to sometimes deeper than 60 centimeters in the soil after four years of growth. Uh, and this, is, this required uh, rebars and crowbars and all sorts of stuff to actually break down uh, the limestone to get it between. And if you go down far enough, uh, this is a cave that's about four meters down. This whole area is limestone karst, so it's riddled with uh, water systems and caves. What you can see here uh, are some mature oak and juniper roots uh, about four meters down in this cave. Up here around the top, you can see some fine roots, which are just like the fine roots that we'd find 
that hole in the top, seven to ten centimeters. So we've got these mats of fine roots uh, appearing on cave surfaces. We did some DNA sequencing uh, of these roots to see what was growing on them, and we found some distinct communities of ectomycorrhizal fungi and saprotrophs and lots of other things. And uh, not long after I had uh, visited in a different cave system, uh, somebody sent me some photos of uh, mycorrhizal fungi. So this is a, a boleet mushroom that's appeared in one of these caves, uh, and it's attached, it was actually attached to uh, a root from a mature tree that was poking down. You can see the hyphae on the cave wall there. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on uh, at depth in these ecosystems. And what we found in our study was that we had in our live canopy uh, and dead canopy patches, we were getting much higher uh, seedling survival. We only had 2% of the seedlings that were planted in these open canopies that survived. And we saw these differences in number of ectomycorrhizal roots. We were seeing lots of ectomycorrhizas under the live canopy, not very, not as many under the dead canopy. And then surprisingly, we found lots of ectomycorrhizas on our seedlings uh, have been growing under the open canopy. But it's only really surprising when you, uh, when you see the analysis at the end here, because what we saw when we were digging up those surviving seedlings in these grasslands was that actually the roots were entwined with the roots of large uh, living oaks that were 20 or 30 meters away um, on the outside of the, uh, the patch in the closed canopy. So these seedlings that survived in the open canopy appeared to be doing so partly because they were able to uh, form ectomycorrhizas thanks to those mature tree roots. The overall story from this study was that we found um, we got increases in the emergence and survival of our seedlings um, as juniper and oak basal area increased, as shrub cover increased, as soil organic matter increased, but that they decreased with canopy gap size. We found that specific ectomycorrhizal fungi, the, the, the species seems to determine the root density um, because different fungi produce different structures on roots. Um, and we found that we got a higher root density uh, when you had an increased basal area of live juniper and oak. Uh, and we also found that a higher density of ectomycorrhizal roots equated to a lower richness of pathogens that were found in association with those soils and seedlings. With the seedlings, uh, we found that deeper roots were associated with the, the dead canopy and the open canopy. Um, and that the deeper roots, at least of seedlings, uh, seem to be associated with higher pathogen richness. And we think that those seedlings, uh, their growth strategy is essentially uh, to try and get their roots as deep as possible to try and find water, uh, whereas the seedlings that are growing under a canopy uh, are more, more easily able to access water. And we saw some very interesting interactions between different components of the fungal uh, systems. Uh, between pathogens and saprotrophs, uh, saprotrophs um, negative associations between pathogen richness and ectomycorrhizal fungal richness, uh, and uh, at least in our live plots, we saw an increase in uh, our ectomycorrhizas and saprotrophs. So that was some of the work that we did in Texas. Very briefly, I'll mention uh, some work we've been doing in the UK. This is one of my PhD students, Petra Guy, she's been working on a project that we've called Future Forests and Wild Woods. And it's been a combination of mathematical modeling. So she's looking at uh, using game theory to understand ectomycorrhizal relationships in different types of forests. Uh, here she is doing some research on the ectomycorrhizal diversity uh, of oak and oak soils in uh, what are classed as ancient woodlands in the UK and then looking at uh, whether we can use information on those fungal communities to help when we're trying to uh, do restoration of sites um, that are being uh, prepped for forestry, whereas previously they have either been mine sites or they've been agricultural fields. And so she's doing uh, some mathematical modeling on interactions between uh, mycorrhizal biodiversity, environmental factors, and oak regeneration. She's also testing the mycorrhizal mediation hypothesis, 
and uh, looking at uh, interactions between ectomycorrhizal trees uh, and arbuscular mycorrhizal trees and the uh, understory, which is often uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal. So in this case, we're interested in uh, whether there's any evidence that uh, these ectomycorrhizal uh, and arbuscular mycorrhizal hosts uh, have positive or negative interactions on um, understory diversity. Okay, well, I've gone way past my time. Only one minor technical issue. There are always too many people to thank. Uh, I've tried to list most of the people that have been involved in some way in some of this research, uh, including uh, many, many students uh, and associated volunteers. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I am very happy to uh, do my best to answer them. Uh, and I've also got uh, a slide that I promised I would show uh, because I mentioned dinosaurs and maybe some of you are wondering what on earth that has to do with mycorrhizas. <laughs> so uh, I will uh, turn it over to you if you've got any questions. Do you want to see the dinosaur? Yes. Yes, I know Chad wants to see the dinosaur. Okay, we'll pause the recording for this. We, we want... Could I just ask what um, might be um, arbuscular and ectomycorrhizal trees here in the Acadian forest? Sure, so in, on the... East Coast. Uh, well, actually, where's Keith? Oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> Keith, you're living there now. What um, what ectomycorrhizal and arbuscular mycorrhizal trees do you have in your uh, in your vicinity? Um, well, we have lots of ectomycorrhizal species in the uh, the oaks, the um, you know phagaceae, the, the you know beech, and and uh, of course, there are a lot of conifers here too. So, you know, the white pine, the spruce, the eastern hemlock. I mean, there's a there's a real, you know, range of ectomycorrhizal species here. Um, some very rich habitats. Um, I'm working in some old growth eastern hemlock stands that are just loaded with with ectomycorrhizal uh, species. So. Um, I don't really work on our buscular mycorrhizal system, so I, I can't say a lot about that, but certainly we have very rich ectomycorrhizal systems. Fantastic. Um, your maples are our buscular mycorrhizal. Um, yeah. Is there, um, have you got uh, Eastern cedar out there as well? Red cedar or yellow cedar? That I have not seen. Um, We've got some in. Uh, we've got some up in Ontario near my where my in-laws stay. Um, yeah, so it's unfortunately I haven't been out to that part of the world. I uh, I really must get across there. Did you say maples were arbuscular? Yes. So I have a question, Brian. Okay. So the. Um... The BC work where, you know, the, the sur high, high survival was in the slow growing trees and low survival in the fast growing trees. Um, I've often wondered if, if one way to achieve higher growth, particularly in these uh, breeding um, experiments to get faster growing trees would be to reduce the carbon allocation to below ground. and uh, but what you would expect is exactly the pattern you're describing that, you know, they're, they're paying less insurance and when the drought hits, they don't survive. Do you, do you see any evidence of, of this in your, in your experiments? Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. When you go out to some of these plantations um, that were put in, you know, 20, 25 years ago, and I remember Suzanne telling me about this and not quite believing it was as obvious as it is, but you can go to some of those plantations, you can take hold of a tree and you can move it because the roots are not very well developed at all. Uh, and oftentimes they seem to have shot up really quickly and not 
either not put much um, into their below ground growth, or in some cases, you can actually see that they have their roots have started to grow along the line that the shovel went in when the seedling was put in, and they don't seem to have really spread out from that. Um, so there's there's definitely um, cases of plantations in BC where where we're seeing that very what seems to be that very thing. Uh, so the trees got quite big fairly quickly which of course meant that they met their free to grow requirement um, as mandated by the government. Um, and then the forestry companies were no longer, I believe no longer required to monitor them after that point. But unfortunately what's happened is that a lot of those fast growing trees then uh, seem to be uh, dying quite easily to, uh, to drought um, later. So after after that requirement's being met, so yeah, you can you can go to parts of BC and you can grab some of these trees and move them around quite easily because they don't seem to have invested much or anything into uh, into the roots. Uh, so we have a question in the chat bar. Uh, Adrian asks, "Can you elaborate more on the relationship between retention and presence slash absence of pathogens?" And when you say pathogen, are you referring to species that negatively affect trees and their growth? So in that case, I was specifically talking, at least in the experiments that I've been working on, uh, specifically talking about um, pathogens of plants. Uh, so what we're seeing in those, in those oak experiments, at least, is that uh, where we have a higher density of ectomycorrhizal root tips, uh, and a higher diversity of ectomycorrhizas, we're also seeing correspondingly uh, lower diversity of plant pathogens. Now, this is all that's based on sequence analysis, and um, that can tell us about what's present. Uh, it's not so good about telling us about the uh, the abundance necessarily of those pathogens. Uh, but in that case, what we seem to be seeing is that. Uh, there's a positive association between uh, ectomycorrhizas uh, and the resistance of the trees to pathogens. There have been a few studies that have been done. Uh, there have been a couple of studies over the last few years where people have looked at uh, the, let me get this right, what do they call it? So the, I suppose you might think of it as the resistome. So the, um, the genetic propensity of trees to be able to resist diseases uh, and ectomycorrhizal syndromes, there appears to be uh, a link, at least from some recent papers, suggesting that uh, trees that are associated with ectomycorrhizas may have more options in their arsenal for dealing with pathogens. Um, but I think this is a very, a very new field and people are just starting to, to get into these sorts of questions about uh, tree health and uh, the the ability of uh, tree species and uh, their symbionts potentially to uh, to resist, but certainly um, provision of resistance to pathogens was one of the earlier um, processes that ectomycorrhizas were found to be assisting with. Great, thanks. Uh, this is Adrian. Um, Hi, I was hoping to ask a follow up to that too. Um, are there any positive? I was intrigued by your your results showing that dead trees uh, left within the stand actually ended up having positive impacts on new seedling growth. Um, does that correlation go as far as you know uh, in the elaborate scenario of you know introducing a bunch of deadwood onto a site that um, has been degraded could even fall in deadwood? Have, have you seen any uh, examples of that? and providing positive uh, conditions for, for these benefits to, to, to be seen on the site? So in, in this experiment, um, what, we, what we think is going on is that the, by retaining those dead trees, um, we've got, you've got increased shelter. So the oak seedlings often get fried by uh, sunlight. Um, and there's this mindset um, among 
a certain group of land managers in Texas anyway, that you need to open up the canopy to let these seedlings regenerate because they need sunlight. So once they, they, they cut back the canopy and then the seedlings all start to die because they get scorched. Um, but what we think was happening was that uh, the dead wood is, well, it's retaining nutrients, it's retaining moisture particularly. So you could see that there would be uh, seedlings that survived uh, around drip lines of trees. Um, when it comes to leaving or uh, adding dead wood, that wasn't something that we've done in this experiment, but uh, my colleagues at City of Austin have been adding dead wood um, with uh, inoculation with edible fungi um, as part of a strategy for um, increasing um, resource use in some of these forest fragments. And of course, where you have dead wood, then you're going to get retention of, uh, of, of water due to you know, rainfall soaking into the wood. They're also very, very um, uh, high humidity environments. So in the morning in Texas, if you're there in the right months at least, uh, you often wake up to thick fog. Um, and there's a lot of water that's retained on the leaves, on the bark, on the on the branches, and so you can see this on the dead trees as well. So I think it's there's there's a big component of that that's to do with the retention of water in these really otherwise very arid environments. Um, so we haven't been going in and artificially adding dead wood uh, to see if that would enhance seedlings, but that's a really nice idea for an experiment to um, uh, to follow that up. Great. Um, Jane says, thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, can you comment on how the very low ratio of old forest and more mature stands uh, in today's forest might impact rates and uh, health of regeneration? Yeah, great question. How much have we got left? How much is left in BC, they estimate? Something like 2 to 3%. Um, well, obviously, uh, mature forests have a very different structure uh, in terms of uh, physical structure, in terms of uh, often biodiversity of uh, both above ground and below ground organisms. Um, I suspect that uh, a lot of the planting that's been going on um, may well, a lot of the planting that goes on in places like British Columbia is favoring uh, the improved seed that we were talking about earlier. And so are we, you know, are we favoring fast growing seedlings that maybe then don't contribute to, um, uh, to good healthy forests at the end of the day? Why are we spraying deciduous uh, trees if, if we want forest regeneration, if we want water retention? Um, those uh, species like uh, alder and uh, birch and aspen, which are important components of these forests, need to be retained as well. Um, yeah, I think the loss of a lot of these uh, ancient forests is, well, I mean, there, there's a lot of unknown consequences, aren't there? I mean, in many cases, it's too late to know what, uh, what, what diversity they would have had uh, because they're already gone. So, yeah, difficult. Difficult question to answer. I, I suspect that uh, we should have been protecting them uh, a lot better than we have been. Thanks, Brian. You're welcome. I have another question. Um, if I'm taking people on a walk in the woods, what are some things I can show them um, in non-mushroom time? to illustrate how mycorrhizal fungi facilitate? So one of the things that you can do is find a, uh, a pine tree, um, or at least uh, a conifer that's a member of the Panaceae, uh, dig around a little bit in the soil, find some fine roots, and you will almost certainly find ectomycorrhizal root tips. Uh, you'll probably find uh, some uh, mycelium. You might find some rhizomorphs, uh, which are where you have big aggregations of, um, of mycelium that form more like tubes in the soil. We find a lot of those in Texas when we were working in those forests. 
Um, and you can show them with ectomycorrhizas the nice things. You can dig up some uh, pine roots and you'll be able to see those ectomycorrhizas. And I, I often describe them as, it's like looking at little corals uh, on the roots of plants. Um, so that would be my tip. I, I would be extremely surprised uh, if you didn't find uh, ectomycorrhizas um, if you went and dug around in the soil around some pine trees. What depth? Oh, um, probably within the top five to 10 centimeters. There's often a lot of uh, fine roots uh, with ectomycorrhizas on them that are uh, infiltrating into the, um, the leaf litter on the surface. Thank you. That, that picture that I had on the very first slide in the talk was a bit unusual. So this one at the bottom right there, it's actually from a tetra carp forest in Malaysia. And those are the roots of an ectomycorrhizal tetra carp tree. And in those forests, because it's a, um, a peat swamp, you'll see the roots sitting on the surface. You can see those are the ectomycorrhizal structures on the roots there. You'll also find these coils of hyphae going around. And it seems to be what they're doing is waiting for leaves and other uh, material to fall from the canopy. And then they land on it. And then you'll see the hyphae going into the leaves. Um, in the pine forest, you'll see, you'll probably see structures like that just, just below the surface. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, well, with that, uh, thank you again, Brian, for this really interesting talk. Lots of fascinating things, and uh, it's a really, uh, it's a hot research area. Lots of new discoveries being made all the time. Uh, so with that, um, MTRI will not be having a seminar next month. So the next time we will see everyone again is in the new year. If you missed anything from tonight's seminar or would like to rewatch it, you can stay tuned to our YouTube page where we'll upload all of our seminars. Um, so with that, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season and we get to see you all again very soon in 2022. Thank you very thank much. You.